All right, hi everyone. Come on in for the Teen Science Cafe. I'm gonna give it a moment. We're expecting a good crowd today, so I'm gonna give it a moment to let you all get into the room. play around with a couple of things so I can see. So as you all are entering the room, just give me one moment. I'm gonna introduce myself in just a second. Yes, I, my uh, Eva and Emily, you've been here before. So hi everyone, I'm Lauren Traster. I'm the 4-H Teen and Leadership Program Coordinator here at UVM Extension with the 4-H Program. Some of you have been with us before, and that's awesome, so you know the drill. But for those of you who are new, we love for everybody to introduce themselves. So find the chat box and tell us your name and where you're from. And I see we have some of our friends here from Vermont. Um, John, just so you know, we do get participants from all over the country. So hi, Mon V from Missouri, and Adrian knows that I love Rhode Island, so thank you for always calling that out. And we have Flip, Philip from Lexington, Mass. And we have uh, Catherine from Vermont and Paxton and Scout from Livermore. Scout, is that Livermore, Maine by any chance? You gave a town, but I don't know the state. We also have Alexander from Belmont, Mass. Logan's here from Jericho and Asher from Vermont. We have Zachary from Massachusetts. Love it, Simon and Jack. So you guys are gonna have to tell me today who's, when you comment in the chat, let us know if it's Simon or Jack. Cause I know Simon, you were very clear last week that it was you and not Jack. <laughs> so, um, right, <laughs> Jack or Simon. I'm never knowing which one of you is talking hilarious. So I just want to welcome you all and I'm so thankful that you all have started to put your names in the chat box. If you need our live streaming today, I'm going to actually put that in the chat box for you right now. So if you need our live streaming services, just go click that link that I just put into the chat box and that will get you set up for the live captioning. I'm gonna continue to keep introducing yourselves as I go through our Zoom protocols. So all of you are muted today. Um, the only video that's on is mine and our presenters. Um, the way you're gonna communicate in the cafe today is through the chat box and through the Q&A box. And we use those two features very differently. We use the chat box to answer questions that the presenter might ask of you to elicit feedback and discussion. And you can use it to raise points that are related to the topic. We don't use it for just random chit chat. We stay on topic in the chat box. Um, but, uh, and I know our presenter is gonna be asking you some questions today. So we use the chat box for that. We use the Q and A box for you to ask questions of our presenter. So any question you have for our presenter today will go in the Q and A box. But be specific with your question because we may not get to your questions until the end of the presentation. So we will answer every question, but if you go into the Q&A box and you like a question someone else asked, or maybe they asked a question you were gonna ask, you can actually click on the thumbs up and it will upvote a question. But again, it doesn't really matter the order that the questions are because we will answer every question that you all ask today. We think it's really important that your questions get answered. So we will make sure to do that. So we just ask that you be courteous and respectful today. Um, you know, limit distractions. And really the only thing that can be distraction, distracting is the chat box. So again, just use it appropriately. Stay engaged, participate fully. I think today's uh, presentation is gonna be really interesting. So I'm looking forward to it. Before we get to um, today's presentations, I like to always remind you of other opportunities that uh, we have available through the 4-H program here in Vermont, open to anybody. So we have a speak up contest. Um, tomorrow night, we're starting a Learn to Code program and you still can sign up for that. Um, we are having a youth environmental summit that's starting at the end of the month. And we do have a program, the Try for the Environment, you actually do need to be a Vermont youth 
Um, but this program, we train you to be a teen teacher in an environmental program. So I encourage you all to go learn more about these programs. You can see the, the website you need to go to to learn about those. I just learned today about this program that Earth Echo has where they're kind of doing, in a sense, the, uh, almost a cafe like we are, but it's more about um, STEM professionals. And so they call it a virtual career connections. And the website that I gave you here, you can go check it out, see what's coming up and learn about different STEM careers. And it, it's focused on female professionals, but hey, you'll learn about the career, whether you're male or female. And they have recorded their sessions. So you can go back and they, it looks like they probably have at least um, 20 or so recordings that you could go check out. So I think you might learn about some interesting STEM careers there. So encourage you to check that out. And then um, we do have some friends that are also doing science cafes. Um, the Watershed Alliance here in Vermont has some that are focused on watershed science. And then our friends in Maine have a series that they do and the links are here. And I can put these in the chat box um, before y'all leave today. So I wanna now go ahead and focus on today's presentation. We're gonna be talking about space. And our presenter today is John Holleran. And John has recently graduated um, with a bachelor's degree from Vermont Vermont Technical College. He just graduated uh, last May. And John is pursuing a career in the space industry, applying knowledge of space to the engineering challenges of spacecraft. He recently worked virtually as an engineering intern at NASA's Glenn Research Center. So I wanna take this time to welcome John here today into our Teen Science Cafe. And very excited to hear what you have to teach us about space and spacecraft. I am very excited to be here. Uh, one of the things I wanted to say is what I'll be talking about today is largely a um, just kind of scratching the surface. So there's a lot I won't go into detail about. Feel free to ask questions that are related to space, even if they're outside of what I talk about today in the slides. And with that, I think that's uh, is the slides working? Perfect. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Lauren introduced my uh, introduced me well. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that I am a Vermonter, born and raised in Chester, Vermont. Uh, I was actually homeschooled, uh, so I didn't go to high, any of the high schools you went to. Um, but born in Chester, I had two internships with NASA. The first one was working with material science. We were building carbon fiber samples. And then the second one this past summer was uh, where I was virtually working on power systems, actually designing hardware for spacecraft, which was an incredible opportunity. And let's see. Let me get my notes pulled up. So today, uh, this is the overview of what I'll be going through. I'm focusing on the environment and the challenges associated with space, uh, of which there are many, as we'll see. So to start out, I'm going to talk about the very basics of rocket science. What is rocket science? And then we're going to follow a particular mission, the mission of Apollo 12 through the different phases of that mission. And after that, that provides us a story to follow. And it's also, I chose this particular mission because this happened just over 50 years ago. Uh, so this is the year of the, the, actually the year of the 51st anniversary as of no, uh, November. After we talk about Apollo, we will talk about the, uh, some of the more modern things, the International Space Station, which is currently in orbit, uh, and then talk about the future, the far future, which is Mars, and the near future, which is the Artemis program. After that, we'll go into Q&A, uh, which again, feel free to ask any sort of space-related questions. There will be questions sprinkled throughout the presentation. 
uh, feel free to just type in your best guess in the chat box. There's no consequences for getting it wrong, and it's always fun to test your own knowledge and, and learn new things. So uh, that is something to engage with. And with that, let's start on the topic of the, the very basics of rocket science. So rocket science is used as kind of the epitome of, of something that's difficult. Oh, we say, oh, at least it's not rocket science. But the truth is rocket science itself is not all that difficult. It simply relies on Newton's third law of motion, which states that for every action, there is an equal and an opposite reaction. With a car, a car travels by pushing against the road. An airplane travels by pushing against the atmosphere, but a rocket doesn't have anything to push against. So it has to bring its own fuel because it pushes against that fuel. By pushing that fuel out the back at very high velocities and having a high amount of mass, it is able to accelerate in the direction it needs to go. So that's the basic principle, and this is achieved many different ways, and I won't get into that, but you can talk about fuel, you know, different types of fuel, the pros and cons, different types of acceleration, etc. But we'll be talking about chemical rockets uh, like the one you see here. So the most important equation in rocket science is, is the one you see here, the rocket equation. And what it says is uh, the change in velocity, delta V, is related to the exhaust velocity and then the logarithm of the mass. So delta V is basically the mileage of a rocket. If you want to land on the moon, it takes a fixed amount of delta V, regardless of how big or how small your spacecraft is. So if you know the mass of the spacecraft you need to bring somewhere, you can find the mass of the rocket that you need to bring it there. And then the logarithm is saying that if you double the amount of fuel in a spacecraft, you do not double the delta V, the change in velocity that you get from it. Instead, if you need to double your delta V, you need a huge amount more mass, uh, fuel mass rather. So, in order to work with this, we need to minimize, whenever possible, the mass, which is done through staging. So we remove uh, the parts of the spacecraft that are no longer needed. So we'll dig into this particular spacecraft. This is the Saturn V launch vehicle. And you can see here that the vast majority of it is the fuel. The parts that are not fuel, a large part of the volume is the, uh, the orange are the, the rockets themselves used to accelerate. Uh, the red lines are where the spacecraft will, will uh, break apart. So that first section, after it expends all its fuel, breaks off from the spacecraft, and then the next stage is um, engines turn on, that's, that's what pushes it into space. A lot of rockets are around 5% payload, 5% or less. And with the Apollo, because it was going all the way to the moon and all the way back, only about 0.2%, less than a percent of that payload uh, of the rocket actually came back to the Earth. Um, so that's, that's the rocket itself. Rockets are, by their very nature, big. Um, they can come in any sorts of sizes, though. The electron rocket is the one you can see in the middle, standing up. That is about the size as a tractor-trailer truck, and there are rockets in development that are that fit inside of a tractor-trailer truck. Actually, this particular one costs about six six million dollars, which is a lot of money but relatively cheap for launch vehicles uh, for the industry. And this puts about as much mass as a four-wheeler into orbit, which is actually small for satellites because a lot of satellites are very large, car-sized or, or whatnot. But that's nothing compared to the Saturn V. And this, uh, this picture with the engines is a very real picture. These engines are massive. I have stood next to them in a museum once. Um, but this rocket is, is as tall, 
taller than the Statue of Liberty. Just this huge thing. And it costs a total of about $1.2 billion to launch. So it's a whole lot more, but it was also capable of a whole lot more. It brought people to the moon. Space is expensive. Technology is expensive. And in order to make these things work at all, you have to put a huge amount of technology and effort, design, a whole lot of science into making these rockets work well, which is by very nature, very expensive. But then we have to talk about the energy requirements. Here's one of the questions. How far do you think, uh, if you go straight up, how far do you have to go before space begins? Uh, because you know we we know it begins somewhere. Where is that cutoff? Where's the where does space begin? Uh, so feel free to type. Yeah, yeah this is the perfect opportunity to use the chat box. So what do you think? How far up does space begin? So Adrian says seven hundred miles. Philip says hundred kilometers. Adrian, sorry, Adrian, I don't see miles. Oh, it's going fast. You guys are. <laughs> Okay. So good see. answers in here. We have 140 kilometers, 9,000 with no miles or kilometers. Uh, when the atmosphere ends, uh, 50 miles, 1,000 miles from the ground. <laughs> Zachary says a lot of zeros. <laughs> or 149 miles, 10,000 miles, 1,500 miles. Uh, we have another 1,500 and 10,000, 500 miles. I like Asher says the karma line. <laughs> it's the Carmen line. Okay. I was thinking like, ooh, whenever your karma kicks in. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys have some great answers and a lot of different answers. Was anyone close? I, there was one person who was actually dead on 100 kilometers, oh. which is 62 miles. So for context, um, here's a, we, can, we can look at Vermont as a state. 62 miles is about the distance between Burlington and St. Johnsbury or Castleton to Brattleboro, or as is shown here, going from White River Junction, Lebanon, Hanover area to Massachusetts following the highway. It's not that far in the grand scheme of things. And this, uh, it is called the Carmen Line. And actually the atmosphere does not end at this point. The atmosphere extends um, hundreds of miles beyond it, but this is where this is about the lowest that a satellite can orbit at all. Most satellites orbit at very least about 200 kilometers up. Uh, most are in the range of 400 to about 600, actually. Um, but it's not all about distance, not all about going up you can go straight up and come straight back down without expending that much energy. The vast majority, 80% of the energy is actually in going sideways because the ground is always pulling you down. And if you're going fast enough to the side, that downwards pull will build up, it builds up slowly, but by the time you're moving down substantially, the earth is next to you because you've passed it. And that's a very uh, very short explanation of how uh, spacecraft stay in orbit, but it's about the horizontal motion. So a lot of that is talking about um, the, the basics of rocket science. And now we're going to get into the actual environment itself and, and the challenges associated with it. So the very first thing is launching. Um, you may have heard a, a rocket launch before, it's just those great big roar. People who have been in person experience, uh, say it's just this, this rumbling in the chest that you can feel. And there's this huge amount of vibration and acoustic energy from every rocket launch. And nothing experiences that like the satellites. The satellites have a huge amount of vibration because they're actually on the rocket. And this has torn apart spacecraft before uh, the, the vibration. So what we do is uh, before you can launch, you have to uh, put this on a test stand and shake it, uh, throw acoustic energy at it. They have great big speakers um, to just see 
will this spacecraft actually be able to survive the, the test environment, the launch environment? In addition to that, there is atmospheric pressure. You've got a fast moving rocket going through the atmosphere, which would tear off small parts. So what they do is they put a fairing, like you can see on the bottom picture, um, and that encapsules the payload, the satellite, so that nothing breaks, nothing comes off. It keeps it safe. Now, acceleration is an interesting one because most, um, most satellites are okay with large amounts of acceleration, but people are not. People don't do well when it comes to about 4Gs. So when we're launching people, the rockets need to throttle down in order to keep that acceleration low. And the reason the acceleration is changing because as you burn fuel, you have lower mass, but your thrust is constant. And uh, F equals MA, so your, your, your acceleration is proportional to your, your mass and your uh, thrust. So you have a higher acceleration. Now, many engines are not capable of actually throttling down. So for the Apollo rockets, they had five engines on the bottom and they would turn the center one off. They just turn it off to limit the amount of G's. In addition to that, uh, there is the weather to consider. And it seems like more often than not, spacecraft get... Um, the, the launches get scrubbed or delayed due to weather concerns. Uh, in this particular flight that we're considering, which is Apollo 12, this spacecraft was struck by a lightning not once, but twice. And I won't get into exactly why, but uh, it damaged a lot of the systems and nearly caused the system to, uh, the mission to abort. But they did make it into orbit eventually. So, one of the, the, the questions is, what are some of the challenges that you can, can think of that come about from the, um, the being in orbit? What are the, the challenges? And from um, a lot of it has to do with, there's a low probability of something going wrong in a short time span, but there's a constant chance. There's always opportunity for something to go wrong and every mission will end at some point. Uh, so what are some of the, the challenges that you can list of, of things in orbit? Um, debris, yes, that is one we'll talk about. Yeah, uh, have, uh... No breathable air is definitely an important one. Radiation and fire. I did not include fire. I should have. Uh, the Mir space station actually had a, which is the, a Russian space station, had a major fire on board, which nearly caused the loss of the space that space station. So fire is a big one. Uh, yes, low gravity, um, leaking fuel, seals. All of these are good things. Uh, comets are, are def I didn't talk about those. Alien spacecraft, um, that is another talk entirely. Um, and losing oxygen. Yeah, those are all excellent things. We will talk about a few of those as we go through. Communication, yep. And space rocks, that falls under the space debris. TIE fighters, hmm, that's an interesting one. Um, again, another talk entirely. Unfortunately, because there's only time for so much. So someone said um, the, the low gravity, and they did not say zero gravity, which is actually uh, very good. It's technically not zero gravity. A spacecraft in orbit still experiences about 90% of the gravity that we experience on Earth. But because they're in constant free fall, they, it's considered as microgravity. Now, microgravity allows science to be done that can't happen on Earth because gravity affects things and sometimes in ways we don't really expect. So the only way we can study the, the effects of gravity on processes is to go beyond the gravitational field and, and be in microgravity. But in addition to science, it has um, effects on human bodies. 
Uh, most satellites are fine with microgravity, but we are adapted to having 1G of acceleration on us at all times. When we don't have that force, our bones and our muscles are not being used, so they start to degrade. And uh, because there's no gravity pulling fluid and uh, blood to the, our legs, now the, that fluid builds up in our heads, which causes issues. So for the degradation of muscle and bone, the, the best way to deal with that is exercise. Astronauts are required to do at least two hours of exercise every day just to maintain shape. But even after two hours of exercise every single day, they cannot stand when they return to Earth. And they have to go through a process to build up that muscle and get ready to walk again. They have to be re rehabilitated. And, and this is only after about six months in space. And, and this is a video of them in microgravity. There's no sound. So if the audio doesn't uh, work, that's why. Um, one, one thing you may notice is the motions are slow. And this is not in slow-mo. This is real time. Uh, this is just a bunch of astronauts playing around in some of their rare free time. The motions are slow because there's less of a sense of urgency. You don't need to move fast. And also because you're surrounded by so much equipment that you do not want to break. So that, that ball right there is going a little bit fast, in my opinion, because that might be able to damage something. And it's something you have to be careful about. So. Uh, one thing that you do have to deal with is orbital decay. Satellites will stay in orbit for days, for years, for decades, millennia, of uh, nearly forever. And you need to plan accordingly. So an orbit will decay. If it's in low Earth orbit, there's atmosphere. I mentioned that um, space officially begins at the Kármán line, of 100 kilometers or 62 miles, but there's still a large amount of atmosphere and or, uh, a satellite can only last there for about a day before it collides back to space. Or actually- John, okay. I'm gonna yeah. interrupt for one second. There of was course. a question in the Q&A that might be helpful to people. You've been talking about a lot of Gs. <laughs> um, uh, what is a G? Yes, that's an excellent question. Uh, one G is one times the, the force of gravity. So on Earth, we experience uh, the, the Earth is pulling us down with a force of 9.81 meters per second squared or 32.2 feet per second squared. So it's an acceleration. Now you may hear uh, in a, a movie about fighter pilots or something, they're talking about G-forces. When they do a maneuver, they are rapidly accelerating, which means they're under many G-forces. But the same thing happens in a rocket. If you are accelerating away from, uh, if you're on a rocket which is accelerating, you're feeling a number of, of um, or you're feeling acceleration. And an easy way to measure that is to say, uh, put it in units of G-forces. So if something is three Gs, it just means it's around 30 meters per second uh, of acceleration or, um, or around 100 feet per second squared of acceleration. So it's a, it's a useful unit for uh, measuring acceleration. So uh, a spacecraft in orbit is, in low Earth orbit, will experience bumping against atmosphere, um, there's concerns about the uneven gravitational pull from the mountains, from oceans, uh, and there's also light and thermal radiation. All of these things will cause satellites to decay over time, but that can be a very long time. On the right, you can see a plot, and this actually made major news back in 2018. Uh, there was a large satellite which had, a lot, we had lost control of it, were not able to communicate, didn't know when it was going to or, um, enter the Earth's atmosphere. Usually for large spacecraft, we can uh, plan the deorbit and we can actually 
make it deorbit over the ocean where there's no risk of damage. But for this one, we had lost control. There was no way uh, it could have landed over New York City. It could have landed over London, wherever. We had no way of uh, controlling it. It ended up coming down right off the coast of Chile uh, in South America. But as you can see, something around 200 kilometers in altitude, uh, because on the right or on the left of the chart, that's in kilometers. Something at 200 kilometers only lasts for less than a month, only a few days. So you have to tune the altitude to your expect expectancy for that uh, payload. If you have something that you only need to stay in orbit for a year, you can put it in a low orbit so that it will decay after, um, after its mission is done. If you put something in too high of an orbit, it just becomes space debris, which is apparently not the next slide because I wasn't paying attention. All right, so the next slide is on radiation. We will get to sp uh, space debris eventually. You may have heard of the three types of radiation being alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays. And each of them is stopped by a different layer of thickness, but in space terms, we talk about more than just those three types of radiation. We talk about things like cosmic rays, solar flares, and trapped radiation. So cosmic rays are often accelerated from um, galaxies uh, a long, long time ago and very far away because of through supernovas, black holes, and things where um, there's a lot of force and acceleration these particles can have incredible amounts of energy. Uh, there was one particle that was measured, a single particle had about as much energy as a, I think as a football, or sorry, as a baseball being thrown. The same amount of momentum, same amount of energy, which is ridiculous because this is a single particle. When, uh, when these hit Earth, they often break up in the atmosphere though. So they collide with um, high, the, the, the sparse atmosphere high up and will rain down in a shower of different particle types. Um, but those are from galaxies a long, long time ago and far, far away. Solar flares are events with the sun. So the sun can accelerate particles. Now, the acceleration is smaller, but the magnitude, there's a whole lot more of them because the sun is nearby. Um, so these are, are from the sun, and these are often uh, blocked by the Earth's magnetic field. However, then you have trapped radiation, because in blocking these sorts of particles, the radiation can get trapped inside of the magnetic field. So, there, and then uh, we can look at something like UV light, which is technically another type of radiation. The worst type of UV light is UVC, ultraviolet C, which means it is far, it's more energetic than UVA, which is only a little bit beyond violet. Uh, so UVC, the worst type, is blocked almost entirely uh, by the atmosphere very early on. Whereas UVB, some of it still gets down to the ground. And UVA, the majority of it still gets down to the ground. So that's an example of how the atmosphere is blocking radiation and, and protecting us. In the same way, the magnetic field of the Earth is blocking uh, radiation. So that's why these are effects that we only really notice once we get up into space. And we don't really notice them here on the ground. Now, radiation can have uh, dangerous and unpredictable effects. If you are in space, you will be bombarded by radiation. Even if you're in the Earth's shadow and you're not able to see the sun, the cosmic rays are still coming from every direction all the time. So they are still a danger. When you are in the suns, um, the when you can't see the sun, there's, there's radiation uh, issues there as well. In binary, for example, we would write a the number 13 as being 1, 1, 
zero one. And radiation is able to affect the memory of a computer and flip bits. So if it just flips one single bit, that can become the number five instead of 13. So that information is being lost and that spacecraft can be lost from that single mistake. In practice, uh, what we've learned over the decades is there are ways to mitigate this with uh, building them into the software and building them into the hardware. We don't have any good solutions for human travelers uh, yet though, because radiation is best protected by just having a lot of mass. But mass is heavy and you can't send excess mass if you're going somewhere. You need to make something as light as possible. So that is a very active field of research is how do you shield against radiation? Um, and astronauts have a increased risk of, of diseases and cancer because of their um, exposure. And it's not far and above what everyone else has, but for example, the astronauts who went to the moon have increased risk of cancer, uh, or sorry, of cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease, diseases with the heart and the blood, um, blood systems, because the radiation is increased once you leave the Earth's magnetic field. So I've mentioned the magnetic field a few times. And uh, Earth has a very particular magnetic field. It's a strong, uh, continual uh, shield around Earth and protects us in many ways. One of those being it will uh, trap and reflect radiation. Many of the satellites are in low Earth orbit, so they're actually still protected by the Earth's magnetic field. But if you go beyond low Earth orbit, you lose that level of protection. Uh, micrometeoroids. These are natural debris. So um, space rocks, dust, asteroids, all fun fall under the category of meteoroids. In, in low Earth orbit, these can average uh, around 200 kilometers per second, but they can be as fast as 54 kilometers per second. A flake of dust at that speed would rip right through you or right through your spacecraft, uh, probably. And they can be incredibly dangerous. You can see on the right, this is an impact test done in a lab. This is a, a sheet of aluminum 13 uh, centimeters thick being hit by a one centimeter aluminum pellet at a speed that is still under the average velocity of, of, um, of this debris. And as you can see, it caused this huge amount of damage. If it had been a little bit more powerful, that bottom piece might have come free and flown into the spacecraft and done damage, even though there's this thick aluminum plate. So adding more mass is not practical way. You can't do that all the time for protecting a uh, spacecraft. Instead, we use something called a Whipple shield, uh, developed by Mr. Whipple, apparently. And what happens here is um, these particles are so energetic that if they hit pretty much anything, they explode. They'll puncture right through that thing, but they explode in the process. So you have a very thin layer of like Kevlar, for example, and then you have a foot of distance or so, and then a sheet of aluminum. Notice in this image, that sheet of aluminum is much thinner. It seems about a centimeter. And here, the particle has exploded on that front layer and only causes scorch marks. It doesn't, it doesn't dig into the aluminum because here it's dissipating all of its energy over a large area. So this allows uh, simple and weight effective protection against space, um, space dust and space debris. So this is a very important method. Uh, but the uh, micrometeoroids can have other effects as well. At any moment, they could hit someone who's doing a spacewalk. So it's important to build a spacesuit in a way that can protect uh, against micrometeoroids and, and space debris. 
and over time they will wear uh, wear down on the spacecraft solar panels and, and things like that. So it's important to understand challenges like this. Uh, but space debris is a little bit different. These are man-made objects and are uh, there's a whole lot more of them, but they're moving at uh, lower velocities on average. Now by lower velocities, I mean somewhere in the range of four kilometers per second to 10 kilometers per second. So, you know, it would take about a second to go through town um, or less than a second. It's still ridiculously fast but can be a little bit easier to protect against. Um, these are often old spacecraft satellites and such, but they can be rocket stages, which can be multiple tons. They can be the solidified exhaust from rockets, but they can also be from things like uh, paint flecking off of a stage and that, be that becomes space debris or collision debris. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Right now, there are about 3,000 active satellites in orbit. And compared to about 4,000 dead satellites. So these are satellites that are no longer serving their function. Uh, we're not able to deorbit them. So they're just in orbit until they decay naturally. And this is a big problem. In terms of tracked pieces of space debris, which includes the categories above, there are 34,000 pieces larger than 10 centimeters, which is about this big. And these can cause serious damage to any, any sort of a spacecraft. And all those numbers are estimates, but um, governments keep a very close tab on tracking all of the, the debris in orbit. Now, you may have heard of the Kessler syndrome, and this is, uh, this is kind of the worst case scenario for space debris. And it stems from the concept that space debris makes space debris. If you have a small piece of debris and it collides with a satellite, that will make more than one piece of debris. It can ruin the satellite for one thing, but it might break off thousands of other pieces or whatever. If there are too many things in orbit that can be broken apart, a chain reaction can start where one satellite explodes from a small collision and then all of those little pieces then collide with other spacecraft, which collide with more spacecraft. And eventually, not only are there no spacecraft in orbit anymore because they've all been destroyed, but all of their debris, all that dust makes a layer around the planet and we can't launch new satellites anymore. So this is a, a real concern uh, that could happen. We might be getting to the brink of, of something like that happening eventually. Um, but there are also ways to mitigate this, one of them being uh, use a low life orbit. So if you know your, your spacecraft is only going to last for five years, you can put it in a five-year orbit. You could put it in a orbit where if the satellite dies, it will deorbit within two years and then use fuel to just keep it in orbit, which will mean that if, you're if it suddenly dies or something, it will still be deorbited on a, on a timely fashion. Um, you can remove dead satellites from space. That's really expensive, but might be what we need to do eventually. Um, and another thing is you can actively avoid satellite uh, debris in orbit. This is what the space station does, for example. If there's a high risk of collision, it will uh, do a maneuver so that it's not in the same place at the same time with this debris to avoid the debris. Now, many people will point to the SpaceX Starlink satellites and say, you know, SpaceX is going to like double the number of satellites in orbit which many people say will accelerate the Kessler syndrome. And I, I disagree with that, and I'll explain why. The satellites are in a five-year orbit. That is, if they lose communication right now, they would deorbit within five years, which is still enough time to cause issues. But they have thrusters on them so that as long as we still have communication, 
they can deorbit within about a, a month or a few months. But what really breaks the Kessler syndrome to me is this active debris avoidance, which is uh, the Kessler, when Kessler proposed this, he was thinking that these satellites were in the orbits that they would always be in and they couldn't move. And now we're seeing technology where satellites are able to know there's a possible collision and perform a maneuver to avoid it. Um, so the Kessler syndrome is certainly something we need to be concerned with, but I think it's less of a concern than some people make it out to be. There are plenty of other things that will uh, cause issues for your spacecraft though, such as thermal management. On the right, you can see the New Horizons spacecraft. This spacecraft went out to Pluto and was able to photograph Pluto, get measurements, did a whole bunch of exciting uh, science. And here you can see this yellow coating. This is called uh, MLI, multi-layer insulation. And um, it provides insulation to keep the heat inside the spacecraft because the sun is so weak. You'll also notice there are, um, there's like these fins to the right of the spacecraft. That is a, a way of generating electricity that does not require sunlight so that it can go as far away from the sun but still have power. On the bottom is the Parker Solar Probe, which went in the exact opposite direction. This satellite is going down to the sun and it will actually enter the sun's corona uh, with some very clever engineering, which I won't get into. But this one uses reflection. It needs to reduce the amount of heat. So depending on where you're going, you need to consider the thermal uh, factors. When you're in space, for, for example, the Apollo spacecraft were basically roasted. They'd have the sun coming in from one side, but the other side is this cold vacuum of space. And they would rotate very slowly so that the heat never built up too much on one side, but instead would be uh, dissipated throughout the spacecraft. In low Earth orbit, there is another concern though, which is thermal cycling. So an orbit, a spacecraft will, um, when it enters the sun, the Earth's shadow no longer has the sun's energy on it. And then when it comes into the sun, suddenly there's that heat present. And that thermal cycling can cause uh, material fatigue and other issues. So thermal cycling is one of those things that you don't really learn about much when you, um, I guess you don't really think about much. It took me a while to, to learn much about it. That's what we want to say about um, being in orbit. And those same effects, you'll always face those same effects regardless of where in space you are. But there are other um, forms of space. So after this point, uh, we have translunar space. So what does, what does it mean to be, and this is a question for the chat box, what does it mean to be uh, translunar or cislunar uh, in space? That's not what I want to. <laughs> I was gonna say, and, is Adrian's response to this question? It's like a marshmallow being roasted. Uh, yeah, Eva. so that, the thermal management is exactly like roasting a marshmallow. You don't want all the heat on one side. You need to uh, spread it out across the, the, um, the marshmallow. We've got some other comments. It means past the moon, something about the moon, between the earth and the moon. I don't know, around the moon, between the moon and the earth, like right in the middle. <laughs> exactly, it's just, it's the space between like outside of earth orbit, well, outside of low earth orbit, going out to the moon, uh, going beyond the moon. So for the Apollo spacecraft, uh, remember I mentioned that it was hit by lightning twice during launch? That caused a lot of, problems. But during the launch sequence, they didn't have time to diagnose those issues. So the orbit went in, uh, the spacecraft went into orbit around the Earth for a few hours while they diagnosed every single issue that could have come up with the lightning strikes. 
and eventually they determined that it was safe to go on with the mission. So it was in Earth orbit for a while, and then they did what's known as the translunar injection, where they accelerated from Earth orbit off to the moon. Um, and with the translunar injection, here's a fun fact, it's a particular type of orbit called a free return trajectory. And what that means is even if the engine fails once they get to the moon, it will still return to Earth. They don't need the engines to direct them towards Earth. And that's exactly what saved the Apollo 13 mission, or one of the things that saved the Apollo 13 mission. Because the orbital dynamics will, will slingshot the, the uh, craft around the moon, but point it right back towards Earth. So the first thing that you experience when you're uh, leaving Earth orbit and going onto a translunar injection is the Van Allen radiation belts, because there's always something in space that's trying to kill you. The magnetic fields are, as I've said, are uh, protecting the Earth from radiation, but they do so by trapping radiation in the belts which means there's a huge amount of radiation that is basically stored in the, in the magnetic field. And when the spacecraft leaves uh, low Earth orbit, it passes through these. Now, that in itself can be um, a problem, but not, not only that, while the inner belt usually starts around an altitude of 100 kilometers in orbit, uh, in altitude, there's one spot where it dips down to 200 kilometers. That is, this radiation belt is 200 kilometers above the Earth's surface. And every satellite goes through this belt every day. And it causes a lot of memory glitches, uh, the things I've talked about earlier, the issues with radiation. So you have to design your system around this. This is called the South Atlantic Anomaly and is right over South America and the South Atlantic. And is um, the, the, the why is a little bit unrelated, so I want to get into that, uh, but it's interesting. So the, there's two radiation belts and each of them trap a different level, different type of radiation, um, but they're both dangerous and, and they're not, so dangerous that you'd get fried going through them, but they're dangerous enough that you don't want to spend a lot of time there or to go through them multiple times. For the Apollo spacecraft, they passed through going to the moon and they passed through a second time coming back from the moon. And overall they were uh, safe in doing that. But you're also leaving the Earth's magnetic field. And because you're leaving that field, you're no longer protected by the magnetic field. So again, the Apollo astronauts had a high, have a high risk of cardiovascular disease because they spent only a week outside of the magnetic field of Earth, or up to a week. Uh, you also have to deal with the effects of there being constant sunlight on your spacecraft. But overall, the, on the way to the moon or on the way to Mars or wherever, you're dealing with the same effects that I've already mentioned. Uh, the environment hasn't changed all that much. Until we get to the lunar surface. So again, Apollo 12 was a lunar mission to land on the lunar surface. Uh, how long do you think uh, Apollo 12 was actually on the surface of the moon? So this is the time between uh, the spacecraft landing on the moon, and then they would go out and do science, whatever, and then they, they took off and returned. How long do you think that was? We've got a day, a month, less than 24 hours, a couple of hours, hours four, four hours, hours 30, 30 minutes. minutes, two to three days, an hour, a few hours mm -hmm. a week, four, four hours, hours, two, two days, days, three months. Anyone close? I wish it was three months. Uh, yeah, some of them were pretty close. It was 32 hours. 32 so hours. So not quite two days. Yeah. But, you know, it was much longer than the uh, Apollo 11 mission. I forget how long they were on, but I think it was 
12 or something. Every Apollo mission, because there were uh, six Apollo missions that landed on the surface, each one stayed a little bit longer on the surface than the past one. Um, and we'll go into that a little bit in uh, a little bit later. But the lunar surface poses a whole new set of challenges, namely the challenge of the regolith. So we talk about the moon or Mars having regolith, but we don't say soil. What's the main difference? What are the differences between what we call regolith and what we call soil? Why do we not say the lunar soil? What do you guys think? This might be a little bit too technical, but just shout out any anything you can think of without Googling it. It has been broken down, texture. Textures I'm going to very... throw in that there's no microorganisms, mm -hmm. composition, no oxygen. You can't, you can grow stuff in soil, porous to rocky. Soil also includes bacteria and other microorganisms. Uh, the regulus is a bunch of dust. There's a lot of very good answers in there. Yeah. Actually, a lot of people are hitting it right on the head, which is that there's no microorganisms. There's no organic matter. It is, in fact, just rock. It's like sand or gravel. It can be of any size, but there's nothing living. Um, but while that is important, um, that's the, the distinction between regolith and soil, the texture is what makes regolith so dangerous, which is it's bombarded by these charged particles, by micrometeorites, by all these different things, which cause pockmarks and spikes and odd shapes on the rocks. But they don't have any wind to smooth them out. You would never find dust with a shape like that on Earth. But on the moon, every particle has an odd shape. And these can, it's kind of like asbestos. It can get in your lungs and cause um, lung damage. It can get on your space suit and wear away at the joints of your space suit. It can break down the fabric. On the very last Apollo landing mission, Apollo 17, they had been out in the regolith so much that they were afraid to go out one last time while like they were scheduled to do because they thought that the joints on their spacecraft would fail. There was just too high of a risk. So it's just, it's again, this, this battle of attrition, it's, it's always uh, causing damage slowly and you never know when it will start to fail. So we can work around this in a few different ways. One of them being most of these particles are electrically charged and thus they can be removed from a spacesuit with an electrical signal, um, electrostatic removal. You can design a spacesuit that is only on the outside of your spacecraft or your space base, and thus you never have to bring that dust inside of the spacecraft uh, and things like that. So there's, there's a huge amount of effort that goes into designing a space suit. And this is why you can't bring the spacesuits that are on the International Space Station. You can't use those for the moon. Those are designed only for the microgravity environment and they can't handle the regolith. So we need a new generation of spacesuits. But there's other effects as well, namely the low gravity. Um, so how long do you think the the Apollo 12 mission had was actually outside of their spacecraft, walking around, collecting samples, uh, things like that. So we've got an hour. Yeah, Declan jumped right in with an hour. <laughs> Anyone else? Four, four hours, hours, minutes. Minutes. Another four, four hours. hours 30, 30 minutes, minutes. A few hours. Six hours minimum. Minutes. 10 minutes. Ten minutes. Four hours. Yeah. So this is actually, again, their EVA time was longer than the, um, longer than the EVA time of Apollo 11 because they were here to collect samples. Uh, so there's some, some very close answers here, uh, but the, the real answer is seven hours and 45 minutes uh, because they wanted to maximize as much time as they could. So again, there were two, um, two astronauts on the surface 
and they did two different EVAs uh, with a total cumulative time of, of almost eight hours. Uh, but that was the time on the, on the surface. Uh, and again, every, every Apollo mission, they were able to spend more time out there and doing more. And without going into too much detail on the difference between mass and, um, and weight, there is a very important distinction there. Weight is how uh, gravity is pulling on you. Yep. Uh, weight is how gravity is pulling on you. Um, mass is your resistance to acceleration. On the moon, there's low, uh, you have less mass, or sorry, less weight, but you still have the same resistance to acceleration. So it's hard to jump. You still feel like it's a slow jump, but you go further when you do it. So now we have a video. Apollo, when you do this, then you go down slope. This is Apollo that first 17. Step is a long one. The last one, and they were playing around on the surface trying to get used to the motion. I'm having. And I just love the angle right there. Um, but you can do a lot of odd things on the lunar surface that you can't do on Earth. So uh, we also want to talk about the, the landing near surveyor. Apollo 12 did something remarkable. They landed a mere 500 feet away from the surveyor lander. This was an American lander that they had sent previously to learn about the moon. And uh, they were able to learn about the, the dust from the, um, that was on the surface of the probe. And they brought back a sample of the probe. And, and there was a little bit of conflicting information, but um, I guess I wasn't sure, but there may have been bacteria on the surveyor spacecraft that survived since the surveyor spacecraft was launched into space. So it had spent years on the surface of the moon surviving uh, because microorganisms are uh, capable of surviving in some very odd circumstances. And I've compared this mission often with Apollo 11. And this is, um, Apollo 12 is interesting because it was the very first mission to bring people to the moon, which had the goal of science. President Nixon had challenged the, or Kennedy, uh, had challenged us to go to the moon and bring a person back within the decade's end, but that was politically motivated. And the Apollo, NASA was able to add science to the, to the mission, but it wasn't just about science. So Apollo 12, they had already completed Kennedy's challenge. But now they were going back for the sake of, of doing more science, getting more samples, uh, and they were able to accomplish that. That is the story of Apollo 12 in a uh, brief summary. But there's always more to talk about. So now I'm going to move to some of the more modern, um, more modern things. So uh, the International Space Station has been in orbit for a long time. Uh, so I have two questions here. One being, when was the last time that we had humans launch from Earth going into space? And the second question is, uh, what, when was the longest continual presence of humans in space? Let's see. So Emily says 1999. I think they're answering both uh, questions. So I saw yeah, two so years for continual, uh, or a year or so, and then someone thinks the last so, launch was SpaceX. So the SpaceX launch was the ver was the um, the first time since 2011 when American astronauts launched from American soil to go into space. Between 2011 and now, we have been using Rus Russian rockets. So the Russians would launch into space and we'd have uh, NASA American astronauts on the Russian spacecraft. So we've got a few other answers. Uh, 10 years, three years, 13 months. So uh, the last launch of humans into space was uh, three hour, um, 13 hours ago. 
this morning, there was a, a Russian launch bringing uh, three astronauts into space, actually, um, which worked out very perfectly for this talk. But usually there's, there's a, one launch about every uh, six months or so. So in terms of continual presence, the space station has had people on board um, continually since November 2nd, 2000. So 20 years marked in, it'll be 20 years in about three weeks from now. Um, it's amazing to me that we've had a continual presence this long. Um, yeah. But we have to talk about what is the space station and why is it important? Um, it is the only laboratory, you know, we've got laboratories all over the earth and they're built in unique circumstances or to study different things. It's the only laboratory with microgravity. And if we want to study something about how does gravity affect this or that, this is the only place we can use to test that. For example, uh, growing crystals. Prote uh, proteins can create crystals in uh, just the right circumstances. But on Earth, the force of gravity disrupts that delicate process. So we need to bring it up to the space station to be able to make that work. Uh, and there's pictures of that on the bottom, uh, crystalline growth. This helps us research fields of medicine or biology, things like that. How do people react to weightlessness? How can we go to Mars if we don't understand the effects of weightlessness, uh, things like that. It also really helps with public engagement uh, and education. Those are very important things for the industry. Uh, and space tourism, as of just a few weeks ago, the very first movie to be shot in space uh, is, is scheduled. Uh, it's October of next year. Tom Cruise and the director and maybe another actor will fly to the space station and film a movie. This is actually happening. This is scheduled, uh, which I find to be absolutely amazing. But we all want to talk about the scale, the size of the space station. Uh, so how, I know I'm using a kind of arbitrary uh, unit here about uh, school buses, but it's something that most people are familiar with. How big do you think the internal volume of the space station is? And, and uh, this is the pressurized internal volume. So like the solar panels are not pressurized. There's this great big beam that goes through the center of it, which is not pressurized. But the pressurized volume, uh, how many school buses do you think that would fill or, or take to fill? Got 30, four, five, four, six, two, four to six, nine, 33, 100, 10 and a half, very precise. Quite a few. So um, actually there were some very close answers. Stop looking this up guys. Um, if you take the internal volume of a school bus, you could fit that same volume in the space station about 34 times. If you take a, a school bus, like the external volume of it, that would fit inside the space station about 10 times. So the volume in this is, is actually remarkably large because this space station was built by smaller modules being bolted together, which allows us to build a large structure in space without launching this huge thing. Overall, this has been the most expensive uh, single item ever, costing, I, I think it's around 200 billion at this point. Um, the studies I was looking at were from 2010, using 2010 dollars, but budget until 2015. So I think overall it's around um, 200. And a large part of that cost is the cost of launching rockets up to the space station. A lot of those launches are autonomous. They're just uh, spacecraft that have cargo inside, no people uh, bringing, bringing goods up. So in 2020, there have been a bunch of launches. Overall in the year, there are scheduled 18 launches, um, of which about three or four of those have people on board. 
and one of the things that's so important about the space station is that you can go up easily and uh, resupply it. If something goes wrong, they can be on the ground within about six hours, uh, which is not true about the moon or going to Mars. Which brings us to Mars. And, and the question that some people will often ask is, why go to Mars? And there's certainly uh, other things on, on Earth that require our attention. But we have to remember that life is not about subsisting. It's not surviving. Life is for living. And we have to do things that are worth doing. And one of the things is exploration. If we go to Mars, that opens up so much opportunity to learn, to do science, and maybe to expand one day. Maybe we will see colonies on Mars. Uh, I do believe we will see people on Mars within our lifetimes. So uh, we have to talk about the human limitations of Mars. Um, I'm not a huge fan of actually colonizing Mars. I think it's important to go there for science, but I don't think we should try to escape Earth and, and rebuild on Mars. I think Earth is something that we should definitely stay and fix. Uh, but but we can still explore and do science on Mars while uh, fixing Earth. So let me ask you the question, how long would a mission to Mars last? And uh, the Apollo missions, it took about three days to go out to the moon and three days to come back. So they were out for about a week. But then you could stay at the moon as long as you wanted. But if you're going to Mars, there's a much longer time of travel to get there. And then you have to wait for a, a specific amount of time before the orbital window uh, allows you to come back. So we've got a few answers. Uh, 80 years, which is a little bit high, though, if you're going there for life, that sounds about right. Um, maybe two years, three years with eight year total, uh, three or five years, two to three. Uh, there's some, some good answers here. Uh, six and a half years, three to five, uh, eight months. Oh, that's very close. So it's the travel time just going to Mars is nine months. You have to wait nine months just to get to Mars. And then after that, you spend another three months at Mars before the launch window opens up for you to spend another nine months coming back from Mars. So overall, it's about 21 months, so a little bit more than a year and a half. That's a long time. Most astronauts that go to the space station spend about six months there. Only three astronauts have ever stayed more than a year, and they were barely more than a year. So we have a lot to learn and a lot to we have to learn how to mitigate these challenges before we can bring people to Mars. And one of the requirements is, uh, remember what I said about after six months in space, you can't stand anymore. You have to be rehabilitated. But if you're going to Mars, you need to land and then just hop right back up and get to work. And to do that, one of the best ways, one of the only ways is to produce some sort of microgravity on the way to Mars which can be done with some sort of a spinning disc. This is definitely something theoretically possible and very difficult. Um, but radiation, we don't have a good solution to the radiation problem. And if something goes wrong, there's no way to turn them around and bring them to Earth. They have to do the whole mission. Uh, once you get there, you might be able to build underground, which would be an excellent shield to the radiation. So I think if we do ever go try to colonize Mars, it would look more like the second picture uh, than the first one being we'd be underground. But there are challenges with the surface environment too. And don't worry, I will wrap up relatively soon. Um, so the gravity is about one third. So you still have gravity, but your, your atmosphere is much lower than Earth. There's no way you can breathe it. You can't really use it for anything. It's very difficult to land a spacecraft because of the very thin atmosphere. And the, the regolith here is, it does have wind on the planet, so it's a little bit less rough than on the moon, but it's still a challenge. 
Um, and then there's the, the speed of di uh, light delay. It takes a long time just to send a signal to Mars or get a response. Our success rate of landing uh, on the surface of Mars is around 50%. We have failed so many times and we've, we've learned so much in the process, of course, but I even remember a, a uh, landing that failed within just the past few years, this uh, Scrapparelli lander. So this is something that we're still learning about. But there's another solution, which is my preferred solution of going to the moons of Mars. And the moons of Mars have barely any gravity. These are tiny compared to our moon. They're pretty close to just being asteroids. But this means we don't need gravity on the way to the moons. We would be able to, because um, you don't need to, to stand up to do any work there. There's no atmosphere, so it's easy to land. And it takes less fuel. In fact, it takes the same amount of fuel, same amount of delta V, which I mentioned earlier, to launch from the Earth and go to the moon's surface, our moon, and come back, as it takes to go to the moons of Mars and come back. Um, so overall, it's, it's a lot easier to go to the moons of Mars. But that's all far future. And let's talk about the near future. And this is the Artemis program. Uh, you may have heard the phrase going forward to the moon. So Artemis is about going, uh, going to the moon. We've been there once, but we have so much to learn still. And through the Artemis program, we have the ability to develop solutions to some of the challenges I've mentioned and also learn in more depth about the other challenges. So there's a huge amount of research um, an opportunity there. Artemis is about bringing the, the first woman and the next man to the lunar surface, uh, hopefully within this decade. The current plan is within, uh, let's see, by 2024, that might slip. Uh, Artemis has become a political program, unfortunately, but uh, overall, the idea is solid, is sustainable, um, sustainable living on the moon maybe one day in our lifetimes we'll be able to talk about the continual presence of humans on the moon as we talk about the continual presence of humans in space. But we are the Artemis generation. This is the generation that will make Artemis happen. Um, and I've been able to work at NASA this past summer. I had an excellent opportunity working on some of the things kind of related to Artemis. Um, but the people who will go to the moon, Mars first are probably alive right now. And that's just amazing to me. But this is overall, not just the NASA side of things, but the commercial side of things, which is where my interests really lie. The industry is just growing at an exponential pace. There's so much to learn. There's so much opportunity. Uh, so if you are at all interested in space, uh, now is the time to be born. So welcome. Um, to conclude, to wrap up, uh, space is difficult, but space is rewarding. And that is just like everything else in, in life. Life is full of challenges. It's full of uh, things that are worth doing, but might be hard to do. Everything that I've talked about today, I have learned because I wanted to learn it. I didn't have any classes that taught me these things. I didn't need to learn these things for my job or anything like that. This is my passion. Go out, find the things that you're passionate about and just dive into them, learn about them and excel in those areas because it's really up to you what you want to do with your life. So do the things that are worth doing. Find those things and get to them. But that brings us to, are there any questions? Yes, yeah, so we do have a lot of questions and I wanna thank everyone for, uh, we are running long today, but um, yeah. what I'm gonna quickly do is I'm gonna launch a poll just to get some feedback, because I know some of you probably have to jump off soon. Let's quickly take the poll and then we're gonna get into the questions. Um, I'm gonna ask, please don't add any more questions to the Q&A, mm. unless there's something like you absolutely have to ask because we've got 23 of them in there already. So it will take a little bit to get through them. So just go ahead, take this poll. If for some reason you don't see it, just uh, put your response in the chat box. 
We're looking for rating today's cafe and on a one to five scale and rating new knowledge that you gained. So I'm gonna just give it a couple of more seconds, trying to get a couple more of you to respond. All right, I'm gonna close the poll so we can get into the questions. All right. So John, I'll read them for you so you can respond. And again, I understand we're running long. It, please stick around for the questions. We're gonna go through them because we are recording. So they will be there. If you need to leave, you can always come back to the recording to hear the answers. But the first question um, that is being asked is, I've heard stars twinkle because of the atmosphere. How does the atmosphere change the light to make it twinkle? And is that true? That is true. And this comes down to um, atmospheric distortion. So the atmosphere is always moving um, due to winds, due to heat motion, and things like that. And this causes refraction like a lens but this happens on, on micro scale. So random motion in the atmosphere will cause the light to bend a little bit. So when you're looking some straight at a uh, star, you might have less light one moment or more light the other, depending on how that atmosphere is moving. So it's really about the, the refraction, the microscopic movement of the atmosphere. The next question, um, what does takeoff do to your body? Also, what is the comparison of how fast you're going on Earth compared to how fast you're going when orbiting? So when you're going through takeoff, that is a lot of G-forces. It's kind of like riding a roller coaster, but it's only about eight minutes. So you're on a roller coaster for eight minutes. Overall, it's not that challenging on your body. The challenge is once you're up in space, because then you're exposed to the microgravity and the radiation. In terms of speed, I, I apologize because all my numbers are in metric, uh, but if you're on the equator, the Earth's rotation means you're going around 600 meters per second. Uh, but if you are in orbit, that is 7,000 meters per second. So you're going about 11 times faster while in orbit than on the surface. Okay, what happens if you spend 40 years in space? If you spend a long time in space, your muscles will become very weak because you are not using them. Your bones will degrade and become very brittle because again, you're not using them. And the, um, you have a very high probability of having cancer or other kinds of diseases like that. Do you think we will ever go to Jupiter? Uh, there is a movement to go to one of Jupiter's moons, Europa, because there, it's an ocean world. There's a small possibility of there being life there. Um, I think that at this rate, assuming that the, the rate is constant, we will end up there. Um, whether that r rate remains constant or if we wipe ourselves out with some uh, something stupid is a whole other question. <laughs> Is it possible to create a machine to accelerate particles? Yes, uh, that is what the Large Hadron Collider and other particle accelerators are doing. And by accelerating particles and colliding them into each other, they're able to uh, create enough energy that you can study it and learn about fundamental physics. Would you have to worry about the texture of regolith on Mars if the ground of Mars even is regolith? So the ground of Mars is regolith because again, there's no organic life or, uh, or organic matter. It's just a layer of rock. The texture would be a concern, but less of a concern than uh, Mars because it's, the texture is a little bit smoother, but it's still not like sand, it's still rough. Two related questions here. Uh, what, the first question is, is a sunburn partially caused because of UVA and UVB? And then related question, how do the different types of UV light affect us? Both good questions. UVA is less energetic than UVB. UVB is what causes the skin, um, what causes sunburns, I believe. 
where UVA is less of a um, less of a challenge, and then UVC would cause a faster sunburn. Uh, it would be worse, but we don't get much of that. And they're they're not like hard cutoffs. You either get one or the other. They're just light in this particular range of wavelengths would be considered one type. Light in the other range is the other type in the same way that we consider the visible light to be of different colors. If any regolith was brought back from the moon, would it be possible to grow anything on it? So there is, there's actually, um, I forget how many pounds of samples have been returned from the moon, but we do have large amounts of lunar samples and you can't grow something on it as is, but if you throw in some organic matter and let it break down, I think it can eventually be used to grow life, or to grow plants. Why does lead protect against radiation more than other substances? It doesn't. Lead protects against radiation effectively because there's a lot of mass, it's very dense material. But if you have one pound of lead compared to one pound of aluminum, say, both of them will ultimately provide the same protection, um, but you would need a thicker sheet of aluminum. That being said, hydrogen-based molecules provide better protection per mass. So the only way to be more mass efficient while using a shield like that, uh, the one that we're developing is hydrogen-based polymers, where because there's so much hydrogen in it, it's able to provide just a little bit more protection while having a constant mass. So what happens if an astronaut is diagnosed with cancer while in space? Will they receive a form of treatment? If they were if, uh, diagnosed with cancer, they would probably be brought back to Earth, uh, probably immediately, but it, depending on the type of cancer, that might actually be delayed. But the chance of them getting cancer while in space is relatively low. It's probably something that we would notice once they're back on Earth and it's had a chance to grow a little bit and that they're getting very high detail scans. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about the dust and um, I think mm -hmm. this question came in when you were talking about the Whipple shield, yeah. how does the dust get the extra mass to make such an explosion? So the mass is because, or sorry, the, the explosion is because the dust has a high amount of momentum. So momentum is related to both the object's uh, mass and its velocity. And because it has so much velocity, a small particle has so much momentum that it would explode on impact. Wow. All right, so how do they protect spacesuits against those micro meteorites? Is it the same methods as with spacecraft, just on a smaller scale, or are there more specific and specialized methods for spacesuits? So the spacesuits um, will use flexible materials so that the very small micrometeorites, which are of course more common, tend to bounce because even though they have high velocity, the very smallest ones don't cause that much of an issue. Um, I think some of the spacesuit portions might use Whipple shields. I know that uh, the hands, which have to be flexible, and other parts that have to be flexible, are the are at the highest risk because the hands are such a material that it doesn't take much of a micrometeorite or or space debris to puncture it. That being said, I don't, I haven't learned of any cases where an EVA people being outside of the spacecraft in spacesuits has been brought to an end or, or challenged because of space debris or micrometeorites. Would a circle of debris around the planet interfere with light? Could we see it from the surface? Probably not because what we see up in space is the large objects that are reflecting a lot of light from a single point. And to see something, you'd have to have a very high density Whereas to cause the Kessler syndrome, uh, it doesn't need to be, you know, it doesn't need to be that dense. It, it could be moderately dense, um, but probably not dense enough for us to see it. 
why does the Van Allen belt dip only over the South Atlantic Ocean? Because the center of the Earth, the geometric center of the Earth is not the center of the, um, of the magnetic field. The magnetic field center is shifted off slightly. So over the South Atlantic, it comes in very close. But on the side that's exactly opposite of the South Atlantic, it goes uh, much higher above the surface. And also the reason it's on the South Atlantic and not over the equator is because the magnetic field is rotated slightly. I forget what the angle is there, but it's rotated compared to the rotation of Earth's axis. Wow. If a chain reaction happens and keeps happening and the particles keep getting smaller and smaller, could they eventually become so small that they darken the sky? Also, who knew dust was so evil? <laughs> <laughs> the Apollo astronauts knew dust was so evil. Um, again, that, I guess that is a possibility if there is a high enough density, but I, I think that we wouldn't quite have that sort of density. Mm. Would different foils reflect sun differently? Like would holographic foil reflect more heat than regular foil? And what foil do they use in the outside of spaceships and satellites? So the uh, New Horizons spacecraft, which I showed, which had that yellow, and also the Apollo landers, you've often seen those having yellow. Those are, I believe, capped on tape or capped on layers with... Um, with a, in a layer of aluminum on them. So it's called aluminized capton. Um, and that's used probably because it's lightweight and it's effective. You need multiple layers because each layer provides just a small amount of protection, but over a bunch of layers, they have a cumulative effect. So I'm sure different, you know, if you're going out away from the space, uh, going out away from the sun, you would need something like that. I'm not sure what type the Parker Solar Probe that's going towards the sun uses. But yes, each type of um, foil would have its own pros and cons. Uh, a lot of engineering in general is about dealing with the pros and cons of, of different things. How do we balance this decision with, with this requirement? We have a couple of questions in here about how things get named. And the first one is, where did the name Regolith come from? The person asking the question thinks it sounds like a Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am guessing it comes from the Greek, probably. It, I know it, it just means that it's rock. So I think it probably comes from the Greek, meaning something along the lines of rock. But I'm not sure. The other question about naming, um, why was the Apollo mission called the Apollo mission? Artemis is the goddess of the moon. Apollo is the god of the sun. Great question. I don't know. Right. <laughs> uh, would different foils reflect sun differently? Oh, wait, we did that, we one. Did that one. Sorry, <laughs> forgot to get rid of it. Could we st simulate microgravity on Earth for, la for more labs in that condition? We can, so gravity is a constant thing. So if you're in a building, you will always feel gravity. You can increase the force above that of gravity. Uh, by, for example, spinning something. But we only know of one way to create the feeling of gravity, which is to go into free fall. So there are drop towers, which are able to drop a scientific payload, and it falls for somewhere between like five and nine seconds. And that's all you get for the, the free fall time. There's also an airplane that, the, that NASA has refitted uh, for parabolic flights. It is called the Vomit Comet. Uh, you can tell where that got named from. But what happens is it flies up to a high altitude and then uh, goes into free fall. And the astronaut, the pilots, have to very carefully control it so that the, the aerodynamics doesn't um, produce force on it that's unexpected. So they have to accelerate downward in just such a way that uh, the people inside get somewhere between like 15 or 20 seconds of zero, of microgravity uh, or, or very close to it. But again, those are very limited in, in scope. So if you have an experiment you want to do, 
the first question is, can you do it in that short time step? Because if you can, those are so much cheaper than bringing it into space. But if you can't, then it has to go to the space station or have a dedicated satellite studying that thing. Did you say each Apollo mission lasted longer than the one before? Yeah, so for example, once we got up to Apollo 17, um, I think they were on the lunar surface for about seven days or something like that. Uh, and they had numerous EVAs going out onto the surface, collecting samples. They were able to, they had, by that point, they had these buggies, little electric cars uh, that they were able to use to drive around on the lunar surface and get many miles away from their, uh, their lander. But that, of course, took a long time. So each one was able to do more than the previous ones. Why haven't we gone to the moons of Mars if it takes the same amount of fuel to go to our moon? So it takes the same amount of fuel, but it would be very difficult to um, bring people for all the reasons that I've mentioned. So, for example, um, food. I didn't even mention food. That's probably something I should have talked about. Food is a consumable. In um, when we went to Apollo, we had to bring all of that food, all of the water with us. In the space station, all of that can be brought up whenever it's needed. We launch every, every about every month, new supplies to the space station. But if you're going to Mars, it's so much mass that it's very difficult to take all of that food with you. So instead of taking all the food, all the water, all the resources with you, we need to learn how to recycle things effectively and uh, maybe grow things on the way to the Mars, things like that. So while it takes the same amount of Delta V, we need to learn how to build these systems. And because those systems will be so heavy, it would still take larger rockets than what we use for, for Apollo. Nice. I want to thank you all for sticking with us. We got our last question. Uh, when you said it has become political, what did you mean by that? And it, why is that a bad thing? That's a good question. A lot of people will talk about, um, let's see, judging by the timestamp, I'm guessing that's referring to Artemis. Yeah. But I've also referred to um, Apollo as being political. A lot of people will say, oh, Apollo is just about politics and use that to degrade it. And I, I disagree with that. Apollo was only achievable because it was a political matter. If without that political pressure, there is no, um, there's sometimes not the, the, uh, the pressure to get things done. When I said that Apollo had, or sorry, that Artemis had become political, the, the reason I, I, I think that's an issue is that the purpose of Artemis what is to go back to the moon sustainably. And I think that because of the political pressure to do this in, in a particular time stamp and to do this in a particular way, I think because of that pressure, it loses out on the sustainability. And I think if we took longer time, we would be able to do it at reduced cost and thus increase sustainability. So I would love to go back to the moon. I think it's an important step. I think we should definitely do it before we go to Mars, but we have to learn how to do that in an affordable way. And I feel like the Apollo program could be improved upon in that, in that area. Well, great. I wanna, let's all thank John for Wow, just a ton of information. This was so interesting. And I was seeing in the chat, many who have already had to jump off thought so too. So I wanna say, first of all, John, thank you for coming and sharing your expertise with us today. I wanna to thank all of you for sticking around and coming. Hopefully we'll see you next week. Um, as always, we have another great presenter coming. And so everyone just enjoy and, uh, you know, just think science, right?